I used to work in a hole-in-the-wall gas station out in the sticks of North Carolina. I was freshly 18, had a new car. It was a terrible Chevy, but it got me from point A to point B, and was newly promoted to assistant manager, so I was working many late nights by myself. Truthfully, I loved working alone. I mean, my boss was super laid back, and his philosophy was, as long as the work gets done, do whatever you please. And we had a shotgun behind the counter, which he taught me to shoot on my first day there, so even though I would be there so late, I always felt safe. On this particular night, it was extremely dead, so with my boss's permission, I closed the store early and hopped in my car. It was probably 11.30 or 12am at this point. Other than being able to get out of work so early, this was my usual routine. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I texted my roommate to let her know that I was getting home early. We always looked out for each other like that. I lit up a cigarette, then started on my way home. For those of you who don't know North Carolina like I do, I'm going to provide a, a little bit of detail regarding the terrain. So, from where I worked at the gas station to where I lived, I had to drive down these back roads. These roads consisted of very dense woods on both sides. Sometimes the woods would seem so thick too that you really couldn't tell where you were, especially at night. This could be intimidating to those who don't know the area, but honestly, I was more worried about deer jumping out in front of me which was a common occurrence in this area. But on this night, I wished that it was just a deer. So I'm driving down the road blaring Nirvana, my favorite band of all time, and just being a typical 18-year-old grunge kid who had newly discovered the freedom of being an adult and getting off work when all of a sudden I see something in the middle of the road, probably 75 to 100 feet ahead. At first I thought it was a deer, but it looked too small to be a deer, so I started to gradually slow down, ultimately coming to a stop. Now, I have to wear glasses when I drive, mainly at night, but my eyesight isn't terrible enough for me to make it a habit or anything, but I grab my glasses and put them on. And being able to see much more clearly now, I almost crap myself at what I saw. It was a woman, an older woman wearing what looked like a nightgown of some kind and her hair was in disarray and she had her hands behind her back. She was just standing there in the middle of the road just staring at me and my car. Let me remind you too that we were practically in the middle of nowhere. There are trees as far as my headlights can shine and it's midnight. I'm naturally paranoid so all sorts of questions were running through my head. I mean who is this woman? Where did she come from? It's midnight. Are my doors locked? Why is she out here at midnight? Should I honk my horn at her? Should I call the police? What if she has Alzheimer's and doesn't know where she is? Or what if she's an escaped mental patient or something? Even though the closest mental facility was three to four cities away, I didn't exclude that possibility. I thought about calling 911, but I get my phone and, of course, no cell service. This encounter went on for a while, too just sitting in the middle of the road mentally questioning what to do. It's way past midnight. She's still standing there just staring at me with this zoned out look, her hands behind her back as if she's observing me. I am starting to get tired of this though, considering that I have to be up early for work the next morning, so eventually I honked my horn at her. And I did not expect what happened next. This woman's face turns from being spaced out to complete rage. Then she raises her arms up and it looked like she was holding something in her hand. She lets out this horrid guttural scream and charges at my car. As she ran closer, I realized that she was holding something sharp. It looked like a kitchen knife maybe or a piece of jagged glass or something. During this moment of horror, I had a brief memory to my stepdad giving me advice when I first got my license. He said, if an animal ever runs out in front of you, turn it into a bump bump. I love animals, so I couldn't bear to do that. But this time, I was taking my stepdad's advice. I was going to turn this lady into a bump bump. Serve the Servants by Nirvana comes on next. I mention this because the song has a lot to do with the aura of that moment in my memory. And, as if it was in sync with the instance in time... The intensity of the song enabled me to let out the most intimidating primal scream that I could, loud enough for her to hear me. But the window was open because I'd been smoking, and I hit the gas. She was running towards my car like she was going to jump on my hood. 
I guess she realized that I had the utmost intent to hit her, in which, at this point, the woman zigzags away from my car and runs off into the woods. Still in flight mode, I didn't question where this woman went. I was just glad that she was gone, so I accelerated on the gas and I sped the entire way home. I got home at almost 1.30am. My roommate was still awake, waiting for me the entire time. She was extremely worried because it was way past the time I said that I was going to be home. She'd been texting and calling me. When I pulled up to our house, I got all the texts and missed calls at once. So, I started to explain to her what happened. My body went from fight mode to panic as I was recounting everything that happened. My roommate's aunt was a 911 operator who also happened to be working that night, so she decided to text her aunt to see if there was any silver alerts in the area. Immediately, her aunt texted back and said there wasn't. And that alone gave me goosebumps to the core of my being. There was just no explanation as to where this lady came from. So last night, I woke up to my dogs barking. As usual, I let them outside to do their thing and when I open my bedroom door, I step out into the hallway and immediately slip onto the floor. One of my dogs had literally been defecating everywhere, running around the house barking and otherwise just raising hell. I get up and I get to the door to let them out and turn back after towards the closet to get some cleaning supplies. I clean it up and I get everything sorted back in the closet and I then let my dogs back inside the house. At this point, nothing too strange has happened so I go and open the door to let the dogs in and two come in right away. Charlie, the defecating dog, stays out near the perimeter though of his electric fence, barking into the dark. I close the door back and go into the bathroom to clean myself up and I take off clothes, shower and then take the clothes, really old so garbage basically, and set them right outside the back door. When I do this, my third dog comes back inside quickly. Still, at this point, nothing is wrong or out of order and I take a towel to a few spots around the house to get all the fecal matter and I decided to throw out the towel along with my pajamas. So I take the towel and head towards and out the back door. I grab the stuff I'm throwing out all together in a small basket and head towards the trash bin. And yes, this is where it just got really weird. So as I walk... I notice it's pitch black outside and no light from inside is shining out since I'd been asleep. And I think it was as soon as I considered how dark it was that I hear whistling. And as soon as I hear the whistle, I hear Charlie inside the house barking. I stop to consider what it was, a bird maybe or something? But when I think about it, it obviously isn't. The whistle goes up and down in pitch with fluidity and stops at certain pitches. There's no rhyme or pattern to it, and I stopped walking as soon as I heard the whistle. Now, I don't believe in monsters or demons or anything like that, but I do believe that there are certainly sick humans out there. I listened for another five seconds, maybe, before I just dropped the basket and briskly walked back inside, locking the door for good measure. I live in Central NC, and I'm wondering if anyone else has experienced anything like this. I slept with my sword off last night and I'm not sure what to think or what to do about tonight. My house was brand new when we bought it. No one has ever lived here before us and we live in a very small and quiet one street subdivision outside city limits. So to our knowledge there has never been a house on this property before. When we were signing the paperwork, there was a statement that we had to sign that said that it had never been on Indian burial grounds. I thought that that was kind of weird, but it's probably something that they put on all house paperwork nowadays. We're a military family, and my husband sometimes has to be gone for days and months at a time. During the first years of our marriage, I was also in the military. I deployed a couple of times, and he went on 10-day trips overseas every month at least, and we've been a part of a lot. I'm definitely used to it by now. But besides double-checking the doors and windows before I go to bed at night, I have pretty much no problem being alone, not counting kids. About a year after we moved in, in 2014, when my son was four, my husband had to leave. I don't remember now if he was deployed or was just going to be out in the field for a week or so, but whatever the reason, he was gone. 
A few nights after he'd been gone, everything was going on as usual. I went through the bedtime routine with my son, giving him a bath and getting him in his PJs, read him a bedtime story and tucked him in with his poo bear that he had since he was a baby. He's always slept with poo and hardly went anywhere without him. I checked all the doors and the windows as usual, then tried to decide if I wanted to spend all of my precious kid-free couple of hours before bed, reading or take a shower, and lose some of that time. I decided on the shower, and when I got out, I dried off and wrapped up in a towel. I walked into my bedroom to get dressed, and I had just reached the side of my bed where my dresser was. Some lights were still on in the house, including the living room, but it was quiet. Quiet enough that I heard little footsteps coming down the hallway toward the living room. Across the room, opposite to where I was standing, was my bedroom door. It was wide open, and I could see into the living room. The footsteps continued, and when they reached the living room, I wasn't surprised to see it was my son. He was the only one in the house besides me, after all. He was in his PJs and holding his poo bear in his arms like he usually did. I thought that maybe he'd had a bad dream and was coming to me for comfort. But about the same time that this thought crossed my mind, instead of coming toward my bedroom door, he just turned and walked calmly and slowly through the living room toward the kitchen. There were lights still on in the kitchen, so I figured he probably thought that I was in there. I called his name and hurried out of the room and he didn't answer. I called him again and looked around the living room before going into the kitchen. Both rooms were empty and he didn't answer when I called his name. And that was really unlike him. I checked the only other room in the end of the house, the laundry room, but he wasn't there. Perplexed and left scratching my head, I turned and began checking the other end of the house, even though there was no way that he could have gotten past me without me seeing him. I finally checked his room and he was laying in his bed with his poo bear, sound asleep. Now, with the way my house is set up, there's just no way that he could have gotten into his room without me seeing him. That is, unless he crawled on the ceiling above me or something. Furthermore, at the age of four, he would never go back to his bed on his own after getting up at night. Any time that he got up, we would always have to walk him down to his room and tuck him back in. Unless he had a bad dream or was scared or something, in which case he would end up sleeping in our bed. His room is at the end of the hallway, and even though we had put nightlights in every socket, he was always scared to walk down there by himself after dark. Even if the lights were on in the hallway too. If we didn't go down there with him, he wouldn't even step foot into that hallway. And this continued until he got a few years older too. Now, I've told this story to a few people and the rational debunking explanations are always I'd been dreaming or my eyes were playing tricks on me, but I had just gotten out of the shower so I was completely awake. If i had only gotten a brief glimpse out of the corner of my eye, I could agree that it was my eyes playing tricks on me. But because I had heard those footsteps first, I was looking straight out into the room when I saw him walk by. I mean, it wasn't just a brief glimpse. I saw him for a good few seconds. This incident didn't really scare me at all. I was more confused than anything, if I'm being honest. I had seen my son walk by, but then found out that he'd been asleep the whole time. I thought for a while that I must have just been losing my mind, but nothing even remotely similar has happened in the five years since then. I still don't know what I saw that night, but I'm convinced that it wasn't my son. So I'm a 28-year-old female living in Scotland, and I have a, a disturbing and odd story that I've never considered sharing until now. So my cousin and I are of the same age and were 14 at the beginning of this long ordeal. My cousin had gotten a new computer and had installed MSN. She added a lot of random people too and she started talking to one boy in particular often. He claimed his name was Mark Halligan, aged 15 from Blackpool, England. They started talking every day and exchanging innocent pictures and becoming close friends. He soon admitted though that he was older, 16, and apologized for lying. My cousin gave him the benefit of the doubt and continued talking to him. He knew it was her birthday soon and wanted to send a gift to her house. She told me this and we wanted to see what he would actually send. So she agreed and he sent her a lot of stuff. DVD player, a huge teddy, DVDs, CDs, clothes and sweets. To cover it up though, she explained to her parents that it was a prize from a school competition. 
Sending gifts became a regular thing, too. He told her that he made the money from an under-21-year-old football placement. A few months passed and he wanted to come and meet up, so she agreed. But, of course, the day before he was due to come up, he confessed that he was actually 21, had a car and a job. She was now 15 and thought it was appealing to be with an older guy and still went through with the meet. I phoned her that night and she didn't tell me much, only that she didn't want to talk to him again and didn't say much else about it. A few days later, I received a friend request from Mark and I accepted and he told me that she had stopped talking to him and he wanted to know why. Obviously, I, I didn't have any answers other than she just didn't want to talk to him again, but we started to become good friends ourselves and we were talking daily. I found him really funny and easy to talk to and I told my cousin that we'd been speaking and she asked me not to speak to him again and didn't tell me why. No explanation at all. That night I told Mark what my cousin had said and he asked if he could call me to sort things out and I agreed and later that night he called. But the voice on the other end of the phone was male but it was kind of squeaky if that's the right word. We spoke and he explained that he had an accident when he was younger and that that's why he sounded that way. I felt bad and kept talking to him, assuming that that was why my cousin got spooked. A few days later, I got a call from my cousin who told me that a large package had arrived at her house for me. I went to her house and we both opened it and it was band t-shirts, CDs, new Converse, books, an iPod and even some money. I was happy being spoiled if I'm being honest. I mean, you see it in the movies, women being showered with gifts and attention. I called Mark to thank him for the gifts and he was happy that I was happy and we kept talking for a few hours. And lo and behold, he asked to come up to visit and I agreed. I told my best friend and she was very wary and insisted on going with me too. The day of the meet, we agreed on a location 10 minutes from my house and we waited at the location. He was 10 minutes late, which magnified the nerves. But at some point, a VW Golf belted towards us and slammed the brakes. And at this point, both of us knew that something was seriously wrong. He sat for five minutes before getting out. What got out of that car, though, was honestly terrifying. We were expecting someone who was 21, handsome and tall. And when he stepped out of that car, he was around five foot tall. He was in all denim. His face looked as if it was covered in burn scars and... Now, this man was easily in his 50s or 60s, which he actually was, and was truly intimidating. We smiled nervously, said hello, and asked him to go on a walk, and while walking, my friend and I whispered and planned to get away. We told him that we were going to pop to my friend's, which was en route to my house, to get a DVD to watch at my place. Both of us hiding tears went to the door, leaving him on the street, we could have collapsed through the door, but we quickly told him what was happening and that we needed to get away. He told us to lock the door and we went out the back door, climbed the fence and ran like the wind between houses and back gardens to a heavily wooded area that led to my house. We stayed there for hours and we knew roughly how long it would take for him to get back to his car and maybe drive around to look for us, so we had to keep away from the roads and we thought that if we stayed put that we would be safe, which we were. During this time, though, we had calls from Mark coming through, but we let them ring out. We ran to my house eventually, and I called my cousin to ask her basically what the hell. Her dad dropped her off to talk about it, and the four of us stayed at mine all night and didn't leave each other alone for a few days. We both got texts and phone calls after this meetup, but we ignored them until he stopped. We were too scared to tell anyone, too, so we decided to keep it a secret. Cut to about six months later though and my friend and I were going to Blackpool for a long weekend with her parents. About two days into the trip I got a text saying that he saw me in Blackpool and confirmed this by describing a mint green summer top that I was wearing and told me that he knew where we were staying. I told him at this point to just keep away or I'd be calling the police and he apologized and agreed. The next day, I was approached by the lady that ran the bed and breakfast, and she told me that I had an envelope. He had written a note that basically said not to phone the police, and he would never call me again, and included £500 for my friend and I. But being stupid and not thinking, we just took the money, already spending it in our heads, and we never said a word. But we didn't hear from him for about a year, and 
Yeah, he resurfaced sending me a picture of him lying with his wrist cut. He texted me after that telling me that my cousin and I had ruined his life because neither of us loved him. I contacted her and told her about the message and I went around to her house and we both decided to tell her dad. He immediately contacted the police, obviously. They asked us to monitor any other contact and report it for evidence. And within hours of sending this picture, Mark had done something absolutely terrifying. He had called my cousin and her dad, insisting that they listen to the conversation. He told her that he had bought her a car and it was outside of her house and he had left the area after dropping it off and gave her a specific description of it. He told her that there was a car key on the wheel, a blue bow on the steering wheel and all the documents for the car were in the back of the driver's seat. My uncle phoned the police again, told them about the car and that he had went out to confirm Mark's description of the car and when the police arrived, they arranged for the car to be towed and to trace the numbers and online profiles that he'd used. But the only information that we got back from the police since that day was that the car was registered to a Pamela Halligan, a person that he has told in previous conversations was his sister which was confusing because he had told us that his sister had died tragically during an IRA bombing in 1979 at the age of 10. But the creepiest and most horrible thing about this was knowing that he was watching us when we didn't know, was at my cousin's house when we didn't know, and he could have been anywhere at any time, knew anything about us, and had the capability to go to extremes. I've also researched his name just a million times with different spellings and everything and I've never found anything. All I know is that his mum and dad owned a hotel in Blackpool and that's about it. To this day, we still get chills just talking about him. Me and my family moved into this house around two to three years ago. My room is the master bedroom. My parents took the upstairs, so that's why I got it. The owner was an old man, around 70 to 75 years old, and he said that he was looking to buy a home in Florida so he could live closer to his family. I live in Ohio, by the way. Now, he was really nice and told us that nothing was really wrong with the house. Well, at least that's what I thought. But... My first experience was when I play siege with my friends early in the morning, around 1 or 2 a.m. I heard shuffling towards my closet and I turn over to look and the shuffling stops. I didn't hear it again for the rest of the day, but my last experience, well, for now at least, was early in the morning again. So it was around 4 a.m. and I got up early to finish my homework, but the only light was coming from the TV and so I went to get my book back from the chair by my closet and... I heard the distinct shuffling again. At first, I thought it was just my cat because she likes to sleep on top of the chair and I grab the nook bag and run back to my bed. But I turn around to watch the closet door swing open and crash into the wall. And inside the closet was maybe a, a hoodie hanging weirdly or some sort of dark figure and I turn my lamp on and the thing was gone. And after this, I closed my closet door and just finished my homework, and I didn't go back to sleep that night. I found a camera in my storage unit, and I'm going to set it up and update everyone again if I find anything. Thanks for listening. For context, I'm now 18 and I live in Australia. This story happened to me about three years ago when I was around 15 in high school. It was after school on a Monday and I had band practice which ran from 3pm to 5pm. Just outside the gates of my school, there was a grassy oval and the oval had gum trees surrounding it like a border. So, usually after band, I would cross straight through that oval to get to the train station on the other side. It was possible to walk around the oval along the footpath, but pretty much all students crossed through it as it was far quicker. The only difference was, though, is that I was alone crossing that oval on that day, since all my friends and other classmates had probably been picked up by parents. Still, I didn't think twice about it crossing alone because, one, it wasn't that far, and two, I really needed to be fast so that I wouldn't miss my train. As I was walking across the oval with my heavy backpack and clarinet in hand, Everything seemed fine, and that was until I got about halfway, and suddenly uh, I heard a voice from behind me. It said, excuse me, could you help me? 
The voice belonging to this person didn't sound too strange or like it had any sort of ill intent behind the words at first. And in my mind, I just quickly figured that they might need directions or something like that, so I turned around. And what I saw terrified and confused me. There was a disheveled man who was probably in his 30s laying under one of the trees, hidden on the edge of the oval. He had a striped tennis bag sitting next to him and something fleshy and pink gripped in his hand. I didn't notice it immediately, but when I was able to see and comprehend what he was doing, I instantly felt sick to my stomach. The man grinned at me and motioned with his eyes down toward what he was doing, and I clenched my teeth and spun back around in the direction I was heading. Every nerve in me was on end, waiting for something terrible to happen, and despite everything happening, I've always been a, a very rational and aware and cautious person, so I simply told myself to act calmly and kept walking towards the train station. I kept a close ear out behind me, waiting to hear footsteps following, but I didn't hear footsteps. But I heard him try once more by calling out, hey, excuse me. I didn't dare turn around and kept walking briskly until I reached the train station platform, where I was so relieved to see what the other people were waiting there for. The train was slowing to a stop ahead, and I didn't get too much time to survey the oval. But there, I saw the man again that unmistakable yellow stripped bag that I saw earlier slung over his shoulder as he was walking lazily towards the train station. It didn't seem like he was in any sort of rush though to be anywhere, as if it was just another failed attempt at finding someone to meet his disgusting requests or something. I gladly hopped into the train though and kept watching just in case through the train window until he was clearly out of sight. I was finally able to let out a breath that I didn't even know I was holding now. I whipped my phone out and quickly called my mum, telling her something bad had happened and that I would tell her when I saw her and I could hear the worry in her voice and she unhesitatingly picked me up from the train stop near my house. I shakily told her everything and she took me to the police station where I made a confused statement about the whole thing. It was a lot to handle for a 15 year old and it made me feel ill retelling the events just over and over. A couple of weeks later and we got a call from the police stating that they didn't find him. From that point onwards I always asked my mum to pick me up after band practice or I'd take the long way around to the train with my friends. But what still sickens me though is the fact that he was knowingly just lying right near a school. I just pray that he never tried what he did to me on any other vulnerable kid. Last weekend, I was with my older sister visiting her best friend since childhood, Kelly, who's very much like a second big sister to me. We were all catching up and downing wine, and I asked Kelly about her family. Her older brother I never really knew well. He was always in and out of rehab or jail when we were kids. Her younger brother was actually my own age, and we were in the same class from elementary through middle school. He was quiet and chubby, a little socially awkward, and had a bowl cut. I always tried to be nice to him since our sisters were best friends, but he was never part of my close friend group. He was also extremely smart and actually got into an Ivy League college. Nowadays, Kelly reported he was living in DC with a good job, but was struggling a lot with depression and other mental health issues. He was also growing a substantial amount of weed apparently out of his apartment. Kelly was worried that he seemed very lost and since their father's death a couple of years ago, he was no longer speaking to the rest of the family for some reason. She was concerned his isolation would compound his downward spiral. Then she mentioned how it's no wonder he has all these issues when their mum slept in his bed until he was 13. And that was really weird. I knew their family had issues, but Kelly's mum seemed like one of the normal ones. My sister asked if Kelly was saying that her mum had sexually abused her brother, and she said, oh no, definitely not, but it was just a very strange Bates Motel kind of vibe. Like, who does that? A teenage boy has no business sleeping in the same bed as his mum. It's wrong. And we were like, um, yeah, that's kind of insane. I mean, what the heck? I started flipping through my memory roller decks of when we were kids to see if there were any signs. My sister asked what he was like at school and how come we weren't close, etc. And then it hit me. A memory from childhood that I'd filed back in the back of my brain archive. One that, before that moment, I had never mentioned to another living soul. So flashback. 
We were maybe in third grade at our community pool in the very deep end. We were playing sharks and minnows, just the two of us, and somehow there wasn't anyone else there. The lifeguard had stepped away, also unusual, and I remember Kelly's little brother jumping off the diving board and me racing to the other side of the pool. He was trying to catch me as part of the game that we were playing. We were both laughing and he caught up to me and went to playfully dunk me under the water, signalling that he'd won that round. But after a few seconds, I realised that he was still pushing me down. I double tapped his hand to say, hey bro, let me up, but instead he brought his legs up to his chest and put his feet on my head. He then straightened out his legs, pushing me down several more feet. I started to panic and tried to break away, but his feet were vice gripped to my head, and any time I tried to move out from under him, he would bring his leg up and push me right back down again. He was actually standing on my head. I jabbed my nails into his legs as hard as I could and scraped them across his flesh. He screamed and loosened his grip, and I couldn't get to the surface fast enough. My lungs felt like they were on fire, and finally I was above the water and choked for air like I was having an asthma attack. I turned back to him, ready to unleash some serious rage for what he just pulled. At the time, I still thought it was just a bad prank that had gone too far, but then I saw his face, just totally emotionless and expressionless, just staring at me. I expected him to start profusely apologizing, but he just sat there, holding onto the wall with a blank stare. It was kind of like he was observing me, waiting to see how I was going to react. Looking back now, it felt like trying to drown me was a sick science experiment for him. I was so mind-screwed by all of this that instead of yelling at him, I just kind of by default stared back. At some point, I just turned around and casually made my way to the edge of the pool and climbed out. And he never said a word. I have no idea why I didn't run and find an adult or call my parents or even tell them or even my friends or something. I think I just very much wanted to pretend like it never happened. I had no idea how to remotely handle what happened to me that day, so I guess I just never really did. Being on the fence about believing in the paranormal, I fear these things, but also expect that nothing will happen, especially if I look for them. Dabbling with Ouija boards and walking among headstones late at night and ghost hunting has probably made things worse for me, I must admit, but it's always felt like stuff has just been everywhere that I've been. I have experienced a significant amount of things that have been unexplained throughout my life but living in the apartment that I live in now has procured a plethora of interesting instances. Only one really stuck with me though, because at least for me it was the most unexplainable thing that I've witnessed, and really left me confused and just wondering. This incident happened a while back in the current apartment that I live in. This is a description of the apartment too, because it will make things easier to explain. So, the front room connects to the kitchen, and in between the kitchen and the front room on a wall is a doorway without a door. This leads to a small hallway going parallel to the kitchen and living room. You can't see anything in the hallway aside from what is on the other side of the doorway because the rest is behind the walls. In this hallway to the right is my father's room, and next to that is a bathroom, and on the other end of the hall is my room. There are also a few closets in the hallway, three to be exact. So, I'd been in the front room just sitting on the couch late at night watching something on television. This TV is right next to this hallway entrance and the couch that I was sitting on faces directly towards it. This hallway, sometimes when it isn't well lit, is pretty creepy and at times gives me unsettling feelings. Strangely, everyone who has stepped foot in this apartment has felt things and even seen black figures peeking around the corner only to disappear back behind the wall a second later. The stove has been turned on without a flame, it's gas, with no explanation and on one instance, my closet in the hallway has opened loudly and the sound of something large and heavy falling was heard but nothing had fallen and the door had opened by itself. Anyway, so as I was watching TV, I saw someone go into my room. At the time, I decided to just keep watching TV as it looked like it was probably just my dad going into my room and maybe to see where one of the cats was or something. This person had the same height and everything, but because I'd been watching TV, I also wasn't looking directly at them. 
So, in all honesty, I didn't really get a good look at who it was, but my father was the only other person here. About ten or so minutes pass, and I begin staring at the hallway, beginning to wonder why the hell my dad had been in my room for so long. What was he doing in there? I didn't feel comfortable with him possibly poking around in my room, so I decided to get up and go into my room to look. I walk into my room, and the first thing that I notice is that no one's in my room. I stood there for a second, a little uneasy, and decided to check my dad's room, thinking that perhaps he walked back without me noticing and was probably up on his computer watching movies or something. But as soon as I reach his room and look in, just a sense of dread washes over me because I see him laying fast asleep on his bed. He had to have been asleep for a while too, and that would explain why he hadn't been making any noise. For the rest of the night, I now and then glanced over to the hallway from the couch, expecting to see something there, and I admit that it caught me off guard and it honestly scared me. I had even been afraid to go back into my room to sleep in fear of something being in there, but I just couldn't see it. At times, when I or a friend had seen things in the hallway, especially outside our peripherals, my first thought was that it could have been the TV lights reflecting off our eyes strangely, or a glare, but this time... I'm pretty sure that it wasn't. I don't know what it was that I saw, and I don't know if it was the same thing that me and my friends have seen on occasions in the hallway, but this is one that I won't forget. It was the first time that I'd ever seen a full-body apparition. So this happened when I was in first grade. Well, I think it did. But based on the people involved, it had to have been, I think. But just know that I was very young, but old enough to be in school. Anyway, after school, I had to take the bus, as we lived a bit too far for me to get dropped off and picked up each day. I would usually get dropped off by the bus on a random street near a different school, with a bunch of kids and my grandma would be there waiting. The street couldn't be seen from the school, however, and it was basically just a, a random street with no real places around. There were some houses, but they were behind walls, so they couldn't see this street. In other words, it was a great place to grab someone and not be seen. So one day, my uncle had borrowed the car and was supposed to pick me up. I didn't know this at the time, so I was confused as to why my grandma wasn't there. Since this was back in the day when little kids didn't have cell phones, I had no way to call her and see what was going on. I was stuck there just pacing back and forth since my uncle was late and all the cars left except one but I didn't pay much attention. Even the kids that would walk home from the bus stop were gone at this point. So about 10 minutes later a, a car pulls up. I can still remember this car because for some reason it had patches of cloth on it in random places as if she was trying to make a quilted car. The ugliness of the car doesn't really matter, but I just still think it was odd and want someone else to have the car's visual in their head. Anyway, uh, an older lady gets out of the car and starts walking towards me as I'm still pacing back and forth. I see her and stop, and then suddenly I heard a voice behind me asking that lady what she was doing. Without taking her eyes off of me, the lady said, Oh, my daughter called and told me that my granddaughter was pacing back and forth on this street and for me to come and pick her up. By this time, the voice from behind me was next to me and I saw it was my friend's mom. She put her arm around me and told the lady that I was the only one there and that I was with her. The crazy lady glared at us for a second before storming off to a car and driving away quickly. It turns out that that car that was sitting there the whole time was my friend and her mom and she was watching to make sure that I got picked up. She took me to her car and had me call my grandma to ask if it was okay for her to come and take me home. If it hadn't have been for her staying around to make sure I got picked up, I know that I could be living a very different life right now. So, thank you to her. So, this is going to be a long story because, well, I've experienced so much. And what I'm sharing here isn't even all of it. Hopefully, though, you'll find it's worth the listen. So, in 1996, when I was 18 years old, my boyfriend ended his own life. His name was Mike, and he was 19 years old. We were together for about two years. Before he died, I didn't really have much of an opinion on ghosts. 
I loved ghost stories and watched unsolved mysteries even, but couldn't really say if I believed or not. I've always just been a bit of a skeptic. But when it comes to this kind of stuff, I needed to see it with my own eyes before offering an opinion. I'm not religious, I don't believe in heaven or hell and all that stuff, but after everything I've seen and everything I've experienced, I have no doubt in my mind that there is some kind of life after death. I don't know how it works or where we go or even what it's like. My theories are based almost solely on what I've seen and experienced myself. I didn't even start reading up on this stuff until it was already happening to me and I was trying to make sense of it. But my experience has happened over the course of about uh, at two years I'd say. It only stopped I believe because I asked him to stop and he would do something to let me know that he was there at least a couple of times a week and as much as I didn't want to lose him, I knew in order for me to continue on with my life and heal, I needed him to stop. So one night I went to a spot that we like to go to and told him, hoping that he could hear me, that I needed him to stop. And why too. And after that I didn't hear from him again for about five years. If you want to hear about why and how he came back, I, I can get to that later if people feel like reading it. For now though, I'm just going to talk about some of the biggest things that he did to let me know that he was still around. So, get comfy because this is going to be a bit of a long one. So the first thing that happened was maybe two or three days after he died. This isn't really a big one, but it was the first thing that happened, so I thought I'd mention it. So, I had a cold glass of soda that I had forgotten about on the kitchen table. It was full of ice, so it was covered in condensation, making a ring on the table under it. I was around the corner cooking something on the stove, and I heard a noise. It sounded like something hitting the table, and then the sound of something sliding and scraping. I looked around the corner at the table, and the glass had moved about a foot to the left of where it had been sitting. I could tell because there was a water trail of condensation left behind. And I knew immediately that that was the sliding or scraping sound that I had heard. At the time, I think I thought it was just weird and I didn't attribute it to anything or even him. But the first time I thought it was him was maybe a day or two later. So it was dark and I was walking home from my best friend's house. The streets were lined with big trees and the streetlights cast shadows of the trees down onto the sidewalk. I could see my own shadow too as I walked and I was staring down at the sidewalk, lost in thought, when I suddenly noticed the shadow of another person right next to mine. It shocked me and made me look around and I fully expected to find another person had walked up to me while I wasn't paying attention but when I turned there was no one else there. I looked back down at the other shadow which was still there and looked around again but I was definitely alone. I kept walking and the shadow followed me and it disappeared from time to time as the lights were blocked by the trees but it would always come back. I was creeped out for sure but mostly just really confused until I reached the end of the block next to my house and stopped. I was just standing there thinking when I felt someone blow on the back of my neck. Mike used to do this all the time and I wore my hair in a ponytail a lot and he used to sneak up behind me and blow on the back of my neck to make me shiver and give me goosebumps. And that's exactly what this felt like. It was such a familiar gesture that I recognized it immediately and that was when I thought that it was him. And that was just the beginning. Over the next couple of years just so many things happened that I could never doubt the existence of spirits again. Things that happened right in front of my eyes and in front of other people even. While some of them could possibly be explained away by someone who doesn't believe... Too many of them are just too crazy for it to be anything else. There was a time that I actually saw him too. It was a couple of weeks after he died and I was watching TV in the living room. All the lights were off so the only light came from the glow of the television. Now, I wasn't expecting it at all so I was really shocked when I looked up and I saw him standing across from me next to my mum's recliner. But what really stood out to me though was the shirt that he was wearing. It was a shirt that I hadn't seen him wear since we were in ninth grade. I'd forgotten all about it, but I recognized it as soon as I saw it because it had so many bright colors on it. Back then, I had called it his clown shirt because the sleeves had big stripes of blue and red and orange, but the rest of the shirt was yellow. And now I could see that same shirt, the yellow with the stripes of color on his arms. 
I could see his head and his shoulders, and the only things that weren't clear were his face and his legs. He had dark brown hair, and he wore it cut really short. I could see his dark hair across his forehead, but the details of his face just weren't clear. Before I could really study him, though, and just as suddenly as he appeared, he was just gone. But why that shirt, though, I wondered. I'd only seen him wear it once, and everyone teased him because it was so ugly, and he never wore it again. The only reason that I could think that he would pick that shirt when he showed himself was because he wanted to make sure that he would get my attention. And if that's why, it definitely worked. The colors on the shirt were definitely the first thing that caught my eye. So, some other things happened too. I had this glass angel figurine and it was pretty big, at least 9 or 10 inches tall and very heavy and I bought it after Mike died and I sat it on the right hand side of my bedroom dresser. One day, I came home and it was on the left-hand side of the dresser. I would move it back and then I would come home and find it moved again. I asked my mum about it, but she insisted that she didn't do it and I don't believe that she actually did. And this happened at least a half a dozen times too. So, I'm going to jump ahead a bit here a little because it's relevant, but when I eventually moved into my own apartment, I had already experienced almost two years of Mike doing all kinds of things to let me know that he was still around when, one morning, my roommate thanked me for blowing out her candles the night before. She slept on a mattress on the floor, and it turns out that she had stupidly taken to lighting candles and sitting them on the floor by her mattress and blankets. That night, she had fallen asleep with them still lit. But when she woke up in the morning, they were out. She figured that I'd blown them out because they hadn't melted down at all and I told her that I did it. She didn't believe me. She asked who else could have done it, so I told her. I was taking a chance here that she would think that I was nuts, but she did it. She asked me if that was why my room was always so cold and I hadn't noticed that. But then again, I'm more comfortable with cold, so I wouldn't have had a problem with it. She told me she always thought it was weird that even though my room was at the front of the house where I got all the light, especially no curtains, that it was always so cold in there. She asked me about what else he had done and I told her about how he would move my glass angel. She wanted to test it so we went to my room and I said out loud, if you're here, she wants proof. Could you move my angel again so I don't look like an idiot? We laughed and then went downstairs for a while and... I look back now and think that I should have stayed to watch, but at the time, finding it moved was something that only ever happened when I came home from somewhere, so I guess I thought that we should just leave. We waited about half an hour and then went back up to look, and my roommate screamed when we got there and found the angel moved almost to the opposite side of the dresser, and yes, we were definitely the only ones home. So, back to only a few weeks or months after he died. My best friend was over and I was telling her about how I saw him and some of the other things that he had done. We were standing in the kitchen and I was wearing a big baggy t-shirt. It was really too big for me, so it was extremely noticeable when I felt a couple of really hard tugs in the back of my shirt. The pull was so strong that it pulled my shirt up tight against my throat, choking me. My friend saw it happen and freaked out, jumping away from me. The tugging stopped and I pulled my shirt down again, but as soon as I did, he grabbed the back of my shirt again and pulled hard enough that it choked me again. I was laughing, but my friend was freaking out and it took her a minute to calm down and I told her that it was okay, it was just him. My parents were away, so my friend and I slept in their bed that night. The next morning, we were laying in bed just talking about him and the different things that he'd done when my friend decides to test him. She said out loud, if you're here, turn the ceiling fan on. She knew that the only way to turn the ceiling fan on was with a remote that was velcroed to the headboard above our heads. And a few seconds later, the ceiling fan above us starts to spin. We started laughing, so I say make it go faster, and it did. It started spinning faster and faster until it was going as fast as it could go, and then my friend said, okay, stop, and make it spin in the other direction. But we laid there and watched as the fan started to slow down until it came to a complete stop and then watched as it began to spin again in the opposite direction. We laughed and said, okay, that's enough, it's too cold, and watched as the fan once again came to a stop. 
I got up to go into the bathroom and a few minutes later I hear my friend shriek. I ran back to see what happened and she said that she was sitting there and suddenly the tissue box had flown off the end of the table next to her. She pointed at it, now laying on the floor in the middle of the room and I wasn't really surprised because he'd done stuff like that before, pushing tissue boxes and remote controls, other things like that onto the floor right in front of me. The house I grew up in had very creaky stairs too and you could hear every step someone took coming up those stairs. My bedroom was directly across from them so normally when the person reached the top of the stairs and stepped into the hallway I could see them if my door was open. And well, I started hearing people come up the stairs but when the footfalls reached the top there would be no one there. A couple of times my bedroom door would be closed and I'd hear the footsteps coming up the stairs and there'd be a knock on my door and I'd say yeah and expect the door to open but it just wouldn't. Then another knock and thinking it was my mum and that she just didn't hear me I'd say it louder but still no one opened the door so I got up to check and there would be no one there. The first time it happened I looked in the other rooms to see if someone was in them but no one was. So I went to the stairs and called downstairs to my mum and when she answered she said that she was in the kitchen and we were the only people in the house. This would happen a lot and I just started saying come in knowing the door wouldn't open. Another time I was in the downstairs bathroom. It was the middle of the night so my parents were upstairs sleeping and I was finishing up my business when I heard a sharp knock on the door and someone say hurry up. I thought it was my mum. She hated when I stayed up late and would come downstairs to yell at me to go to bed. But when I opened the door, I totally expected to see my mum standing there glaring at me, but she wasn't though. There was no one there again. There was one time I was home alone and this happened a lot. My parents had a huge motorhome that they travelled in and I was 18 and having always been a good girl, wink wink, they let me stay home by myself. Sometimes just for the weekend and sometimes for a week or more at a time too. So it was the middle of the day and I was just sitting in the living room watching TV when the stereo suddenly turned on by itself. It was loud, like really loud and it honestly scared me half to death and I jumped up to turn it down and then off again. I thought it was him so I said don't do that you scared me and went back to the couch. Right when I got seated again, the stereo turned on again full blast, like I hadn't turned it down before. I screamed and said stop it and turned it off again. Another night I was up late watching TV in the living room and it was turned down low though because I didn't want to wake my parents, when all of a sudden I heard a noise from the kitchen that sounded like water running. I muted the TV and listened and sure enough it sounded like someone was running water in the kitchen sink. I walked into the kitchen which was shaped like an L with the sink around the corner and the short end of the L and the whole way there I could hear it clearly but just as I turned the corner to get a look it stopped. So I check in the sink and it was wet like the water had been running. I go back to the living room and sit down and that's when the water starts running again. I figured what the hell but got up again of course and right before I turned that corner it stopped again. At this point I'm getting a little bit irritated and a little bit creeped out so I go back into the living room and I sit back down and when the water started running again a third time I said out loud I'm not getting up again and at this point the water stopped. Anyway... That's enough for now, but I have plenty more to tell, so if you guys want to hear more, let me know in the comment section below. So this was two years ago when I was 14. I lived in a rural country area where it's normal to walk pretty much everywhere, whether it's the shops or park or school, and on occasion I was going to the shops because I'd earned some pocket money that week and decided to use some of it on junk food. After grabbing what I wanted and leaving the store, I was walking past some of the houses, one of which had a man out front. He was kind of fat, had unkempt facial hair and a really dirty shirt. Anyone would find it suspicious, but I just ignored him and didn't bother changing my path because seeing hobos in my town was the usual. But he was staring at me the whole time it took for me to close the distance between us while passing him. And it was abrupt when he grabbed my wrist. 
I turned around trying to pull my hand back, but being the small person I was, I couldn't get out of his grip. And that was when he started dragging me towards his house. Now, a little extra info, his house had a lockable gate around it. He successfully dragged me past that gate and shut it without even caring about the loud bang. I was of course struggling and kicking around before stepping on his foot. He wore Crocs, which finally got him to let go of me. I tried to open the gate, only realizing that it had a combination lock. At this point, he was swearing at me and trying to grab me again, and I did my best to kick him away before just attempting to jump over the gate. It was roughly up to my stomach height, and I didn't exactly land gracefully, grazing a few body parts, but I got over. Once I mustered up enough energy to get up and start running again, I didn't stop until I got home. I did check to see if he was following me, but no, he wasn't, thankfully. You might be wondering what happened to the shopping. Well, I ditched it after he started dragging me. And what happened to him? Is he in jail? I did eventually get an interview with the police, and what they said terrified me. The man had raped children younger than me and killed them. And chances are, if I didn't report it, more people would have suffered. But yes, he's now in jail. 